So it's 2019 and we can call it climate breakdown, climate crisis, climate emergency, ecological breakdown, ecological crisis and ecological emergency. You can call it all of those things. So that's Greta Thunberg talking about the climate crisis. In this lecture, we are moving on to look at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, signed in 1992. In next lecture, we'll look at Coda Protocol, and then a lecture after that, uh, the Paris Agreement. So there's a series of lectures. This is a major component of our course, and we're going to take some time to work through it, unpack some of the important science and some of the uh, issues that are really critical for regulating uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally, so carbon accounting, those sorts of things, so we're going to unpack it steadily. In outline, what I want to do in this lecture is start us off with some understanding of the key climate change and ocean acidification science. And we want to do that like we did with ozone for really understanding the regime. So the science itself, you don't need to know in any great detail but you need to understand it to really understand the regime and also the diabolical complexity of regulating uh, and trying to solve this uh, crisis that we face globally. So then with that background in the science uh, to understand the policy targets for emis and emissions reductions, we'll move on to look at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, briefly about its structure and particularly want to focus on its objective, dangerous climate change, and unpack, unpack that a bit. Okay, but can I start with a different topic, a related topic? Can we be responsible for failing to save a life? So this was an article, a very sad article from several years ago about a woman who was jailed for 12 years over her daughter's death. It was a terribly sad article uh, in that uh, the woman lived with an abusive partner uh, who no doubt abused her, but she also was very abusive to the child, sorry, the man was very abusive to the child, and on one occasion beat the child, apparently the child who was only three, uh, was, uh, and she wasn't, um, she was still wetting her nappy, or pooing in her nappy, and the man beat her terribly with an iron bar, and then the woman put the child in a pram and, and left the child in the pram for two, two days, I think it was, until the last two days of her life were lying in a pram, bruised, battered and unable to save herself. And then when she stopped breathing, the mother called an ambulance uh, and obviously a, a terrible, terribly sad situation. The woman, um, yeah really hard. The man was charged with murder and convicted, uh, but the woman was also jailed for failing to, she didn't uh, do the beating, but she failed to take any action to, yeah, and I find, you know, this is really hard, like I find this, these stories really hard as a parent, uh, and yeah, it's just incredibly sad to think of that poor child. Um, being left that way. I th also think that these stories are very different from uh, other tragedies involving children. So uh, these, when I had little, little kids in the point where in the pram and going to childcare, these stories scared me to the bone. The idea that you might be so busy and like forget your child in a car. So you know you're so caught up in your day, you leave them in a hot car. So this was a news report, <coughs> again from a few years ago, about a man who took his child to childcare and then went to work. <laughs> Came back to the childcare, went to pick up the child, was told it wasn't, the child wasn't there, and they went out and found it in the car. The car was parked at the childcare centre and the child had died. So that's a tragic, tragic mistake and incredibly sad and gee, I don't know how you'd live, your, live with yourself. But what we're doing on climate is, is, if we think about it, it's not a tragic mistake. It's not like the parent who forgot their child and it was just a, a terrible tragic accident. It's actually, we know what we're doing. So this is a, coal, a 
small part of a coal mine that I, I worked on litigation against. It, it hasn't gone any further than this test pit. Um, it was a proposed by a, a company of Gina Reinhardt's a few years ago in the Galilee Basin. And uh, these are some of the submissions from, uh, opening submissions from the mining company in 2013 in, in that court case. Under international law, scope three emissions from exported coal are the responsibility of the country in which the coal is burnt and not Australia's responsibility. And that's true. Whether the mine, Alpha Coal Mine, the largest co Australia's largest coal mine at that time, proceeds or not will have no net effect on greenhouse gas emissions and therefore no effect on climate change because if the mine does not proceed, the coal will come from another mine. That reasoning was accepted in the court case and the court decided that there would be no effect on climate change from this mine proceeding. And that those sorts of findings are embraced by the mining sector and embraced by our governments at state and national levels. And we say we're not, you know, we, our coal is not causing climate change. If it, coal didn't come from somewhere here, from here, it would come from somewhere else. So therefore we're not responsible. And it's a, it's a mental trick to avoid responsibility for these things. But uh, yeah, it's the drug dealer's defense. You know, if I don't sell them the drugs, someone else will. Uh, but we, the thing is, we know exactly what we're doing. We know exactly how much coal we're pulling out of the ground because we charge them royalties for all of that. We, you know, are very good at counting the coal and we know pretty well precisely what emissions that will cause and the contribution it will make to climate change of burning that coal. So we're in the coal business. This is a quote from our Premier at the time. We're in the coal business. If you want decent hospitals, schools, police on the beat, you all need to understand that. Now, I don't agree with that second part. As again, again, I emphasise you know, that it's that jobs versus environment dichotomy which is false, but it's, you know, it's a core part of uh, you know, political reality in Australia that um, Guy Pearce described it as we have the, you know, a, um, the political view is that Australia is just a big pit for, you know, to dig, and to sell to others, and that's essentially how our economy runs. So can we re be responsible for failing to save billions of lives in the future, ecocide it's been called? Can we be responsible for that? Are we like the mother with the beaten child in its pram, just basically leaving it there. And I, I think we are. Or in a different context, but are we like the bookkeeper of Auschwitz? So this was a story from a few years ago about a 93-year-old former Auschwitz, Auschwitz, Auschwitz death camp officer uh, going on trial. He literally was the bookkeeper. He didn't turn on the ovens that killed, you know, the gas chambers that kill people. He didn't turn the dial. He kept the books. So he recorded how many people were going into those chambers and being killed. And he was charged with it being an accessory to murder. You know, we know exactly what we're doing. We are really good at keeping the books. So yeah, our actions in choosing to mine and burn all available fossil fuels and not some tragic mistake that's occurring by accident. Scientists are telling us what the consequences will be and we're choosing to proceed. So, uh, I just wanted to... move then to look at climate change in that context. So moving to the context for the evolution of international environmental regulation from 1990 to the present, we've already uh, run through that in the last lecture. So this is the modern period, all of the major bits are in place. Climate change was you know, the recognized since the beginning and then basically global action stalled and was rekindled late and now is in many ways stalled again under the current US administration. So we know about Rio and the Rio uh, Declaration. So this is where the, at the Earth Summit, climate change was recognized. There was the UNFCCC was uh, basically, yeah, agreed at that point. So 
In that historic context, let's look at the key climate change and ocean acidification science for understanding the policy targets for emissions reductions. And yeah, I've said about Greta Thunberg and her, and I just want to also play you her speech. I'm sure you would have seen it, but it goes for a few minutes. And the remarkable thing about this speech, I think it's remarkable in many ways, but how much of the science she gets, I think is perfectly right. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? For more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. How dare you continue to look away and come here saying that you're doing enough when the politics and solutions needed are still nowhere in sight. You say you hear us and that you understand the urgency. But no matter how sad and angry I am, I do not want to believe that. Because if you really understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil, and that I refuse to believe. The popular idea of cutting our emissions in half in 10 years only gives us a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees and the risk of setting off irreversible chain reactions beyond human control. 50% may be acceptable to you, but those numbers do not include tipping points, most feedback loops, additional warming hidden by toxic air pollution or the aspects of equity and climate justice. They also rely on my generation sucking hundreds of billions of tons of your CO2 out of the air with technologies that barely exist. So a 50% risk is simply not acceptable to us we who have to live with the consequences. To have a 67% chance of staying below a 1.5 degrees of global temperature rise, the best odds given by the IPCC, the world had 420 gigatons of CO2 left to emit back on January 1st, 2018. Today that figure is already down to less than 350 gigatons. How dare you pretend that this can be sold with just business as usual and some technical solutions? With today's emissions levels, that remaining CO2 budget will be entirely gone within less than eight and a half years. There will not be any solutions or plans presented in line with these figures here today because these numbers are too uncomfortable and you are still not mature enough to tell it like it is. You are failing us. But the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. We will not let you get away with this. Right here, right now, is where we draw the line. The world is waking up. And change is coming, whether you like it or not. Thank you. So, an incredibly powerful speech. And, yeah, a courageous, a courageous woman.
your child. Um, I can't imagine being 16 years old and having anything like that grasp of issues or that the courage to speak and do what she has done. If we look at the climate science, so Thunberg is a, I think, spot on with everything that she said there and from a scientific perspective. If we just try and understand that a bit and unpack it, there's an incredible amount of scientific information available. So the, I'm sure everyone's heard of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Its fifth assessment re report was released a few years ago. In uh, It works in three working groups. So working group one deals with the physical science basis. Working group two deals with uh, impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. And working group three deals with mitigation. Uh, so if we had it here in uh, hard copy, it would be, it's actually Working Group 2 produced it in two volumes. They're each about 1,000 pages thick, jammed full of references and, you know, hundreds of pages of uh, references of um, scientific work. So it would be four volumes, basically four, I was going to say phone books, but that would show my age, hey, because no one has a phone book anymore. Uh, but essentially four big uh, um, books jammed full of the scientific literature. The IPCC doesn't itself do the primary research. It really collates and summarises, synthesises the existing state of knowledge uh, from the scientific community around the world. So, an incre And they're incredibly detailed, but if you haven't looked at climate science before, they're overpowering and you know, just the amount of information there. So, sorry, I've got something that's happening here in the background that doesn't want me to let me go on. So if we looked at the IPCC website, you'll find a huge amount of information, including uh, a large number of recent reports, so you can go there and have a look at it. The sixth assessment report is well underway. Uh, it's going to come out in, in, um, in coming years. Uh, 2022, I think, is the uh, aim for, for that, so impacts in 2021. So that's well underway. There's also been a number of special reports. Uh, I'm going to make particular reference to October last year, the a special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees and also but I, I won't go into like the other recent special reports I think I want to try and pull out uh, a range of information from uh, important reports but not drown you particularly if you haven't dealt with climate science before I just want to make some uh, pull out the essence of it but not every latest report because you can just feel like it's ongoing waves of information crashing over the top of you in relation to climate science. Uh, if you haven't dealt with climate science before, I highly recommend this book by Spencer Weird, Global Warming the, or the Discovery of Global Warming. Very readable. Spencer Weird was a physicist, I think, originally, and he is a science historian and in, in, writer in the US, and it's a very readable, uh, like a novel. It's like a detective novel of the discovery of, you know, the science, our understanding of uh, how the atmosphere works and the fact that we are, you know, emissions of carbon dioxide can impact it has been known for a century or longer. So it's, uh, yeah, a lot has been learned. It's not just something that happened in the last 20 years. Another good in-between book is David Archer's Global Warming and a lot of the climate science, it gets pretty he phys heavy in physics and calculus and I... I, yeah, not too too hardcore for me, uh, but David Archer does a really good job of sort of blending the two and not being too hard on the the maths and the physics, uh, but giving you a, a detailed technical understanding. So just for some of the simple things, I'm sure everyone knows about the greenhouse effect, but let's just start with it. So we know that the sun emits um, sunlight, solar radiation in the form of light waves comes to our earth, passes through the atmosphere. Um, most of it passes, some of it bounces back out, but it passes through the atmosphere without warming it. Uh, it hits the planet and uh, warms the surface of the planet. And 
some of the energy is radiated back into space uh, by the Earth in the form of infrared radiation. So it doesn't interact uh, greatly with the atmosphere as it comes through, obviously with the exception of uh, ultraviolet light and being absorbed by o ozone, but most of it passes through the atmosphere and then warms the Earth. When it warms the Earth, it's, it's emitted back out by infrared, as infrared radiation, so a lower form of energy. On its outward path, it interacts with the atmosphere and essentially the atmosphere acts like a blanket uh, keeping some of it in or slowing its loss down. And it's that slowing the loss down that is the greenhouse effect. So by increasing the amount of gases in the atmosphere that are slowing down the loss of heat, we're incre increasing the blank uh, effectively the blanketing effect. So it's like, if you imagine on a cold night, uh, okay, so you're lying in your bed tonight and you feel cold, um, and you know you've just got a, a sheet on, so you pull the doona over you, and you feel warmer, won't you? Like so, you've gone from a little light sheet to a thicker doona. Are you actually producing any more heat, like to feel warmer? Are you producing any more heat from your body? Why do you feel warmer? What does the blanket do? it slows down the loss of heat. That's all the blanket does. The blanket doesn't actually warm you as such. I mean, if it's not an electric blanket, it doesn't produce any heat itself. What it's doing is slowing down the, the loss of heat from your body. And that's why you feel warmer. So the, just like with ozone, you know, the ozone layer is often described as like the Earth's sunscreen as a analogy for it. The climate, or the greenhouse effect you can think of like a blanket and sure there are obvious differences between them but as in a broad analogy, a simple idea, that's a good one. So that blanket, uh, yeah it can sound abstract and technical but you know about it from daily life uh, and you can feel it. So if you've been outside in a garden after dark under a dense low cloud layer so let's just test this. So let's just think, okay, it's winter time. You go outside, you know, you're having a party or something, and it's been a sunny winter's day, but now it's just coming on night time. And two situations we'll test. Um, clouds come over just on dark, and there's a thick cloud layer in the evening. So clouds all over, blanketing. Um, the alternative is no clouds come over, so after that warm winter's day with sunlight coming down, and there's no clouds, so you can just see the stars. Is there going to be a difference in terms of how warm it feels at night? Do you think it's going to be warmer under the clouds? So who thinks it's going to be warmer with the cloud layer? So put your hand up if you think it will be. So that's the normal sort of effect of clouds. You get that sort of trapping in heat because that is actually the greenhouse effect because water vapour is one of the most potent greenhouse gases and effectively what's happening when clouds come over is they're trapping in the heat um, through the greenhouse effect. So we're aware of the greenhouse effect from everyday experience. So yeah, on a, cold, on a clear night you can expect overall the night to get colder than if there was a cloud layer. And that's the greenhouse effect. And it's like having a blanket on on a cold night. It slows the loss of heat. And we can confirm the existence of the greenhouse effect and its importance for life on Earth by comparing Earth with other planets and our moon. So if we think of the Earth, okay, so we know we're out from the sun and the earth is um, around 15 degrees mean, mean global temperature. So if we go out further, Mars, it's minus 55 degrees. So you might think, oh well, further from the sun and colder. Going in, Venus is plus 457 degrees. So you think, oh okay, well that's logical, you know, you're getting closer to the sun, so it's warmer. 
But then Mercury, closer to the sun again, and it's actually colder than Venus. So what's going on on Venus? Does anyone know what's happening on Venus? What makes it so much hotter than Mercury that's closer to the sun? Yes, it's got a thicker atmosphere. It's got a super greenhouse effect, doesn't it? So this is just a little summary. Why is Venus so hot? Plus 461 degrees Celsius in contrast to Mercury, which is closer to the sun and much colder. Well, basically the summary is runaway greenhouse effect. Um, yeah, Venus is a virtual twin of Earth. It's similar size, mass, gravity, as well as internal composition. But one of the big differences is that Venus has a much thicker atmosphere. And if you stood on the surface of Venus, you would experience 93 times the atmospheric pressure we experience on Earth. You'd basically have to go a kilometre under the ocean to get that same sort of pressure. So also the atmosphere is made up almost entirely of carbon dioxide. And it's thought that plate tectonics on Venus, Venus stopped billions of years ago. And without the plate tectonics burying carbon deep inside the planet, it was able to build up in the atmosphere. And the carbon dioxide built up to the point that any oceans on Venus boiled away. And then the sun's solar wind carried the hydrogen atoms away from Venus, making it impossible to ever make liquid water again. And the concentration of carbon dioxide just kept in increasing until it was all in the atmosphere. So that's yeah, commonly called the Venus, of, well, in climate uh, literature, it's called the Venus effect. And you know the thought of runaway climate change, what could happen to our Earth? Now, Another good uh, thing to look at for a, you know, independent check on the importance of, you know, the greenhouse effect is the moon. So why does the moon's temperature vary so widely from minus 157 degrees to 107 degrees? So if you're planning a trip to the moon, you're wondering what kinds of temperature you might experience. Well, you're going to have to pack something to keep you warm since the temperature of the moon can dip down to 100, minus 155 degrees Celsius during the night. And you'll also want to have some warm clothes too, since the temperature on the moon in the day will ri can rise to 107 degrees. So basically from the moment the sun leaves it, it's going to start to freeze. And then as soon as the, you know, you're standing in a place where the sun is hitting it, it's, you're going to start to cook. And why is that? You know, because the moon is, everyone agrees the moon is about the same distance from the sun as the earth and for its surface area receives the same amount of solar radiation as the Earth. So why is it so different? Well, the difference is our atmosphere. That's the difference. The atmosphere both basically moderates the, those massive temperature changes and the greenhouse effect particularly distributes and moderates those you know, massive changes in temperature. Uh, and also um, clouds re reflect a fair bit of um, sunlight as well. So it's a, you know, it's a very, very different uh, environment that we have on Earth, and it's because of our atmosphere. So uh, we know that we are you know, burning um, fossil fuels and adding to the blanket effect, the greenhouse effect in the atmosphere. If you look at a picture like this, though, what's the misleading bit if we talk about it in terms of climate change. So you'll often see you know, a picture of a coal-fired power station with a big white plume coming up from it. What's the thing we should be aware of? Those aren't emissions, that's the steam. That's right. So the white clouds are more the steam coming off it. Uh, the actual carbon dioxide is coming out of these tall stacks and more this little hazy area here. Uh, so carbon dioxide is Co uh, is colourless, odourless and invisible to our eyes. So we can't see it. What we're seeing there is water vapour. And yes, water vapour is a greenhouse gas, but it's uh, not, because its cycle is so quick in the atmosphere, it's thought that human activities have not directly increased it. Uh, by increasing long-lived greenhouse gases, it's raised, one of the feedbacks is that it's raised the amount of the, the temperature of the air, so more water vapour is held in the air. So there is a component of water vapour, but it's not uh, the direct, directly caused by humans in that sense. So let's think about the major greenhouse gases. So carbon dioxide, everyone knows about. So that's a carbon atom and two oxygens. So three atoms. And we can observe the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we know since the late 1950s, it's been measured at a, 
uh, observatory in Hawaii called um, Mauna Loa, and it's risen up to the point now it's uh, oh, it's actually 409. It, it's gone past this. I didn't update this slide, but essentially, um, yeah, we've got a uh, obvious um, trend. The annual concentrations of carbon dioxide go up and down. Does anyone know what causes them to go up and down? Yep. Great. It's it's the change in seasons, particularly in the northern hemisphere, because there's so much land mass there. The essentially when the northern hemisphere is in summer and getting more sun, the growth, uh, the photosynthesis from the forests essentially absorb enough oxygen that it actually changes the um, composition of. Uh, well, they don't absorb. Sorry, they don't absorb oxygen, do they? So they are taking in the carbon dioxide. Uh, in during photosynthesis and releasing oxygen and when the leaves drop in in autumn and winter and those break down then uh, that releases a lot of the carbon back into the atmosphere as it yeah in the breakdown of it and then the carbon dioxide levels come back up uh, so there's that annual fluctuation but if you look at the trend which is the black line it's yeah, going up by two to three parts per million per year. So yeah, the carbon dioxide released by burning fossil fuels will continue to affect the atmosphere for a long time. I think this is something that's really poorly understood. And one of the keys to what Greta Thunberg was talking about in terms of the percentage of avoiding like a 1.5 or 2 degree, um, the key problem, one of the key problems we've got is that when we burn fossil fuels, it will continue to affect the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. About 7% of the carbon that we burn now is going to be affecting the atmosphere in 100,000 years. So next time you jump in a car, turn on the engine, you know, let's just say it's an electric car, you're burning um, petrol, and then carbon dioxide is coming out your tailpipe. The impacts of your activity are going to continue to affect pretty well the rest of humanity. So does anyone know how long humans have been around as a species? Any ideas? Anyone want to take a wild guess? How long have we been around as a species? Is it, is it like Homo sapiens, yeah, as a species. Yeah, around about 200,000 years, 160 to 200,000 years is about how long we've been around as a species. So when we're talking on about 7% of our current emissions continuing to affect the atmosphere for 100,000 years, we're talking about, you know, time scales that are, you know, 50% of as long as we've been on the planet. So it's going to affect not only, you know, we talk about 2,100 and, you know, maybe our kids or our grandkids. We don't even have a word for, like, the 5,000th generation, in, you know, from us. You know, because if you think of generation time being, say, 20 to 20 years for humans, then, you know, like, divide 100,000 by 20, and what you end up with, I think, 5,000. So, you know, we're talking about, say, 5,000 generations from us, from right now. That's what we're affecting. So, yeah, the notion that global warming will only last a few centuries is widespread in the popular and even scientific literature. The misconception may have its roots in an oversimplification of the carbon cycle. And you see complicated diagrams like this. Can I just move past that complicated diagram to this, which I much prefer? If we just think about this as the active carbon cycle. So basically carbon moves from the atmosphere through the oceans and land. So if you can, let's just use it, personalise that for us. So who here ate bread or some sort of wheat-based product for breakfast? this morning or today, or like I had a little bit of sushi for lunch, so, you know, rice. So everyone had some sort of something like that today? Okay, so let's just imagine that, you know, the grain of wheat, or one of the grains of wheat of what you ate this morning was growing in a field, um, you know, in, say, the Murray-Darling Basin six months ago. So um, the wheat plant is growing and it's photosynthesizing and uh, taking in oxygen and making essentially sugars uh, and putting that in the little wheat kernel. So that's what the plant is doing. It's taking in carbon dioxide and joining together the carbon into make complicated 
carbohydrates, sugars, starches and like. And that then goes into the wheat kernel. Let's just say, imagine the harvester coming along, harvesting the wheat. It's then milled, made into the cereal or bread or whatever you ate this morning. And now you've eaten it and it's, you've gone through your stomach and it's um, been digested. And let's just say it's in the, your cells right now. And your cell is using that sugar, the carbohydrate. It breaks apart the carbohydrate and uses it to generate energy. And then your blood then transport the waste product, which is the carbon, um, through your, your blood to your lungs and you breathe it out. So you're breathing out the carbon dioxide. So that carbon molecule that's come from, that was, say, picked up by a wheat plant six months ago, uh, you've just eaten and you're breathing it out. So we're part of the carbon cycle. So that is a carbon molecule or carbon atom that's gone from the atmosphere through the land or biota and back out into the atmosphere. So carbon cycling, the carbon cycle. So when we burn fossil fuels, it isn't that it will stay in the atmosphere for 100,000 years. It will cycle through the biota and the oceans uh, regularly. But the problem is fossil carbon has been out of the atmosphere for a very long time. So when we coal, does anyone have any idea like black coal that we produce in Queensland? Anyone got an idea of when that was formed? So black coal, most of it was formed in the Carboniferous period about 280 million years ago. So the coal comes from uh, plants that took in the carbon from the atmosphere, like our wheat plant today, but it took that carbon in from the atmosphere and, and instead of it being released in decomposition or eaten by something and re-released, it got trapped and then has basically, through pressure and time, all of that carbon has been trapped, basically, and the water's been pushed out of it, so you end up with black coal through carbon originally, uh, sorry, yeah, carbon-based plant forms originally, which then gets trapped through pressure and time and heat, is made into coal. And when we dig it up and burn it, we're, it's basically pure ca carbon, depending on the amount of impurities and the like. But basically when we burn coal, we're burning carbon, releasing that carbon back into the atmosphere that hasn't been part of it for hundreds of millions of years. And then it's really slow for it to be lost from the cycle. So that's the active carbon. You can think of it as the active carbon and the fossil carbon cycle. So when uh, this is a picture from a mine pit um, with the coal being mined, and you can see the black um, coal and the overburden is that brown on top. So we've dug down, we're digging up the coal. When that's burnt, we're releasing carbon back into the atmosphere that hasn't, has been out of the atmosphere for hundreds of millions of years. So yeah, fossil carbon or coal. So yeah, coal, most of it formed during the Carboniferous period and yeah, it's been out of the active carbon cycle for a long time. There's different forms of coal in different grades depending on the amount of carbon in it. Anthracite or black coal is the most valuable. Uh, it's a lot of what we produce in uh, Queensland. Victoria has a lot more brown coal which has got a lot more water content about 50% water, so it's really inefficient to try and transport it and burn it because you've got to burn off the water before you actually get any net energy production. Uh, so black coal is a lot more um, efficient to burn. Uh, so yeah, black coal is basically almost pure carbon. And when we um, burn uh, fossil fuels and they go into the atmosphere and carbon dioxide, they don't just stay in the atmosphere. As part of the carbon cycle, a lot of it dissolves into the oceans, not just taken in by plants, but dissolves in water. And when carbon dioxide dissolves into water, combines with water to form uh, essentially acid, more acidic conditions. So by putting a huge amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we're changing the chemistry of the oceans and increasing the acidity through just the chemistry. This is, it's often called the evil twin of global warming. It's not actually related to warming as such. It's just purely the chemistry of putting a whole heap of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and then dissolving it into water. You make the water more acidic. And that's a problem 
for anything that forms its shelf, sorry, that anything that forms its shells from um, calcium carbonate, because like corals or a lot of you know little mollusks, a lot of little shell-based things, a lot of things that are like plankton that are the basis of the marine food chain, a lot of that uh, has greater difficulty forming its shells. So ocean acidification is a yeah the evil twin of carbon of climate change and a huge problem. You know we can measure the change in the acidity of the oceans. So I just want to keep moving on. Um, I don't want to get bogged down in, in the science, but I want to emphasize a couple of points. Uh, so one of the common misconceptions is that, you know, like a one or a two degree rise isn't very much, like because, you know, we're used to dealing with, you know, what was the minimum temperature overnight in Brisbane? Does anyone know what the temperature was? 18 degrees, let's say? Not sure. Um, let's just say, though, we're used to dealing with, you know, would be nothing unusual for minimum temperature to be say 15 degrees and then maximum temperature during the day to be say 30 degrees. So we're used to dealing with big temperature fluctuations on a daily basis so that so when people talk about or you know climate change we're talking about a one or a two degree you know setting a two degree target I'm sure the common reaction to that is well no big deal like you know we deal with 15 degrees every day on a daily basis what can two degrees how can that hurt us? The big difference is that um, we're talking about a shift in the mean. And so it's not just an individual day, but we're shifting the entire temperature distribution. So uh, temperature, you generally think of it like a bell curve, and you're shifting the entire bell. And when we do that, that rise in the mean, uh, it's often said a, a small change in the mean makes a big change in the extreme. So you've shifted the entire distribution. So things that were previously would have been like a record hot day suddenly become quite common. And what was you know, so unspeakably hot that it virtually never occurred, that can also become quite common. And it's those extremes that are the killers for a lot of ecosystem functions, but also for us with things like um, bushfires and extreme temperatures. So another effect that's seen as an increase in variance. So that's actually taking the bell curve and sort of squashing it, where you push out the sides, you get greater variance. So uh, the expectation is with climate change that we both increase the mean and increase the variance. And that then pushes out the uh, extremes, you know, the record hot weathers really significantly. So that's the, it's so, I think it's one of the biggest problems we face is com with communicating this issue is two degrees sounds like not very much and people have difficulty understanding that we're not talking about like just a single a single day or a single two degrees on any individual day we're talking about an enormous enormous change in the whole earth ecosystem and I'd like to just play you this little it's just, I just find this so powerful this is uh, actual data so not a model of uh, the shifting distribution of the northern, sorry, the summer temperature anomalies in the northern hemisphere from 1950 to 2011. So that's the normal distribution. So it starts with, that's the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, then you see it starts to move 1980s, 1990s, 2000s. I'll just play that for you again. So not a model, this is just the data from the Northern Hemisphere. So if everyone, from, say from China, this includes you. So we start with this normal distribution and we see that the actual temperature, obs observed temperature reflects that normal distribution. It's moving about, but basically stable. Then in the 80s, it starts to shift and we actually are observing the entire temperature distribution shifting to the point where, yeah, it's just moved. The entire temperature distribution has moved. So that's what we've observed. It's not a model, it's what we've observed. And in Australia, I don't have as, there's not as um, interesting like little film clip. These uh, images come from um, a, a report from the CSIRO and the Australian Bureau of Meteorology looking at essentially the shift in 
maximum temperature on the left and the shift in minimum temperature on the right and essentially uh, the lines like the the lightest in the one on the left the lightest sort of pinky orange one was the 50s to 1980s and it shifted across to the darker red is the 1999 to 2013 so we've actually seen shifts in the distribution and temperature in Australia as well and also we've seen frequency of extreme heat waves and fire conditions in Australia increase uh, during those you know, since 1910 as well. So we're experiencing those. We're ex we've already experienced a massive change in our climate. And very much so that's contributing to the current crisis in bushfires around Australia. And we're going to see that play out for months, you know, unless we have some massive um, rain event, you know, like a cyclone or two come come in very soon and you know drench Queensland and New South Wales with a lot of water then it's going to be an extremely dangerous summer for a lot of people in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia and Western Australia and uh, around the world. So California, the thing with California is it is one of the richest places on the planet. It has got billions of dollars put into firefighting uh, and yet even they haven't been able to control the incredible bushfires that they've had in recent years. So this is an image from 2017, same in 2018, same as 2019. So their, their fire season is extending. It's, and this is, a, this is a extremely rich community with billions of dollars of resources put towards this and they can't control it. So the effect of extreme temperatures from increased um, mean and variance is really important to understand. So a two degree change is a massive change. The one degree change that we've already experienced is already having major effects. And yet, uh, talked about wildfires, but also uh, tropical storms. They draw their energy from the sea surface temperature. So if we increase the sea surface temperature, we expect tropical storms to become stronger. So the what people say normally about, the science normally says about tropical storms is we don't think it will change the number of them, but the ones that we do get will, or we don't know if it will change the number, but the ones we do get, we expect to be stronger. So what might have been a category three uh, hurricane, or you know, you know that um, in Australia we call them cyclones, in uh, Asia they're generally called typhoons, in the US they're called hurricanes. So tropical storms, um, we expect those to be stronger. So what might have been a category three, you know, becomes a category four or five. So, and that's really just from the physics of a warmer background temperature, just like with bushfires, a warmer background temperature means drier conditions and then more extreme fire conditions. So um, there's some key terms to understand when we think about target setting for climate change. Radiative forcing, global warming potential and carbon dioxide equivalents. It's really that last one I just want to dwell on for a bit. So radiative forcing is a change in heating and cooling effect uh, in different components of the atmosphere since 1750. So um, these are the sorts of graphs you see in the IPCC reports. So this is from the fifth assessment report. And essentially it's saying carbon dioxide at the top, then methane, uh, and other greenhouse gases and um, so carbon dioxide is at the top it's um, strong evidence that it causes a warming effect um, but aerosols so dust particles particularly from industrial processes basically reflect more sunlight so are thought to cause a cooling effect but there's a lot of uncertainty about what their effects are the net effect when you combine all of those is thought to be um, a significant increase in radiative forcing, which is roughly the same as if you considered carbon, di carbon dioxide by itself. So notice up here carbon dioxide, and then the net effect is thought to be somewhat similar to, you know, there's significant error bars here, but um, so that's significant. I'll come back to it. So global warming potential is the amount, essentially the impact of um, a greenhouse gas on global warming. So carbon dioxide is used as the reference, just like CFC 11 was used for the reference in um, relation to ozone. And it has a global warming potential of one. 
then other greenhouse gases have um, different global warming potentials. So methane, CH4, has a global warming potential of 100, sorry, of 21, or it's gone up to 23 in more recent reports over 100 years. Um, nitrous oxide has a global warming potential over 100 years of 310. And sulfur hexafluoride, SF6, which is a chemical that's manufactured and used in some medical procedures, but also high voltage electrical systems, it's got a global warming potential of 23,900. So it's 23,900 times more powerful than a single molecule of carbon dioxide. So in talking about targets for climate change, we talk about carbon dioxide equivalents, or CO2 E. And it's used in two different contexts, one in terms of emissions and one in terms of atmospheric concentrations. In terms of emissions, it's used all the time to, uh, as a standard unit for accounting for greenhouse gases under the Kyoto Protocol. And yeah, all greenhouse accounting is based around carbon dioxide equivalents. So what it does is it allows us to group together all of our emissions of all of the range of greenhouse gases into a single number. So if, for instance, we say we were a company that emitted one tonne of carbon dioxide and emitted one tonne of um, nitrous oxide, our net uh, emissions over 100 years or carbon dioxide equivalents would be what? Can everyone remember nitrous oxide was 310 and carbon dioxide is one? So if you've got one of each of those you've got 310 plus one. So our, the emissions for, that we would have would be 311 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. Does that? Probably not the best example. Hey, um, it's gone on an hour too. Do we want to take a pause? Um, or shall I just finish a little bit? I'll just finish carbon dioxide equivalents and why don't we take 10 minutes pause? Um, Okay, so this is an important building block for when we go on to look at the response because we're going to be talking about target setting around uh, the total emissions. So that's where carbon dioxide equivalence is an important term to be aware of. So that's it in emissions. It's also used a little bit in terms of um, atmospheric concentrations. And in that context, the units are parts per million, CO2e. And you can think about it this way, our current uh, levels of concentrations in carbon dioxide are only about 107 at the moment, 407 of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere right now. So you'll, you might have seen, you know, in the, just in the last few days, there's been reports about, you know, how we've exceeded uh, current levels of carbon dioxide are the greatest for the last three million years. And the last time carbon dioxide was this high, uh, sea levels were, was it 20 to 30 metres higher? Uh, so that's just looking at carbon dioxide alone, but we know there's a range of other greenhouse gases that we're emitting. If you combine all of those, we'd be at around 460 parts per million. But the cooling effect of aerosols is thought to basically cancel those out. So the net carbon dioxide equivalent of where we're at is still around the same as carbon dioxide alone. And so they're often used sort of interchangeably, but they're quite different. The sort of difficulty we have is like if we try and address climate change by cleaning up industry, um, we're going to reduce the amount of dust and aerosols and uh, unmask what's been, you know, the true potential of what's already there, what we've already emitted. So if we take out the dust by rapidly shutting down those industries, we actually expect a spike in global temperatures from reducing the atmospheric, sorry, the cooling of aerosols. So we've got a real problem with that. So yeah, the cooling effect of aerosols currently masks the heating effect of non-carbon dioxide greenhouse gases. So yeah, when we talk about, um, yeah, the net effect is about the same as carbon dioxide, but there's hidden, important, hidden things in that. So the IPCC best guess of equilibrium temperature rises for different greenhouse gas concentrations, 450 parts per million, sorry, 450 CO2e. If we stabilised at that level, then the best guess is that mean global temperature rise would be around two degrees. So you can see the significance there. We're at 407 
parts per million carbon dioxide already. If you look at all of the greenhouse gases um, that we've contributed, we're already past 450. It's only because of the masking effect of aerosols that we don't have, you know, two degrees or, and also lag effects. So that's when Greta Thunberg talked about, you know, to actually achieve 1.5 or 2 degrees, a lot of the models are relying upon us sucking a lot of gases out of the atmosphere using technologies that don't exist at this point. That's what she's talking about. We're already committed. Current levels of emissions are already probably take us past um, 2 degrees. So negative emissions is yeah, a, a significant issue. OK, let's take a pause. 10 minutes, get up, stretch your legs, uh, and come back and we'll, we'll um, keep going, looking at moving into the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. OK, so let's go back to talking about emissions. And we're talking about carbon dioxide equivalents, which is the key thing. I know there's a lot of detail just before we broke. But carbon dioxide equivalence is an important term to understand, and it's pretty simple, really, if you just think there's many different types of greenhouse gases, and what carbon dioxide equivalence allows is for them all to be grouped into a single number. And so when you see a figure like Australia has emitted 550 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalence, that's all of our carbon dioxide, that's all of our nitrous oxide, that's all of our methane from human activities. So, and that's the sort of measures that are used for target setting for climate policy. Those are core sort of measures. So carbon dioxide equivalence is an important term to be aware of. Uh, anyway, um, there's been different approaches to uh, modelling what will happen under different uh, potential future scenarios. So in the third, sorry, in um, previous uh, IPCC reports, they've considered, well, what happens, they so see these graphs, they're going from 2000 to 2100, and then they show emissions in gigatons of carbon. So that's a different, that's just where you focus on the carbon content as opposed to carbon dioxide. Um, but basically, same, effectively same effect. So the carbon emissions associated from 2000 to 2100 under different future emission scenarios with the red dotted line being like the maximum one. And then what then would happen to carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere going from, um, from about now where we're at 407 parts per million. If we just continue to burn all of our fossil fuels, we'd expect by 2100 to be somewhere up around 900 parts per million. And then what that does to temperature. So what happens in the future will affect, you know, what we continue to emit will affect what happens to temperature. So future temperature rises, again, with that red dotted line, if we burn all the coal, then, you know, the model, the sort of range would expect is somewhere between three and six degrees, three and five degrees. So that approach has now changed from what were called the scenarios to now what are called representative carbon pathways. So from 2011 onwards, and, and in the latest IPCC report, they've been using what are called RCPs. So the RCPs broadly are here you've got emissions in gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent a year going from now, 2010, 2020, and then going forward. So the two will just I'll use as references. One is basically the burn all fossil fuels approach, which is RCP 8.5. And then the rapid decarbonisation approach, which is RCP3 or 2.6. So that's the blue line. So, and in between, you can do different things. Uh, but those two extremes, what that means in terms of carbon dioxide concentrations is shown in this graph. So RC, RCP 8.5, you get carbon dioxide concentrations by 2100 going past 1,000 parts per million. And then it continues going on from there so that, you know, you're looking at sort of 1,500 parts per million CO2. Or the other end of the spectrum is we pretty well keep it down around 400 parts per million. Now what that does to temperature is scary. So the burn-off fossil fuels approach, by 2100 we're up around 4 degrees, but warming continues for centuries. So that, you know, we're looking at a surface temperature rise of 
anywhere between five or six and beyond. Um, so that fan shape is really just probability of, you know, that it will go beyond that. The red solid line in the middle is just the, the, the main one, the average one. So the ranges that we're potentially looking at from burning all fossil fuels are way past two degrees. And yeah, the blue line is if we pretty well get out of fossil fuels quickly, then we can probably keep the temperature down beneath two degrees. And the scary thing is emissions are tracking on RCP 8.5. Um, yeah, we've got continuing to basically rise in global emissions. Um, this is just from a few days ago. There was the UNEP 2009 emissions gap report showing that you know 2018, 2019 have had the f the highest um, yeah amounts of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases emitted. That yeah, there is an in incredible amount. Uh, this is the fossil CO2. There's this huge gap between what we need to do to achieve 1.5 or 2 degrees and what we're currently doing right now. And yeah, the UN Secretary General, we're in trouble. We're in deep trouble with climate change. It's hard to overstate the urgency of our situation. And yeah, emissions, global emissions are well on track for more like 3 or 5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, like if you look at what we're doing. So it's yeah, the question is like, can we stay beneath 1.5 degrees? Um, it's possible, but it's seemingly, like it's possible physically. It's seemingly very unlikely that we will do it from a social and political perspective. So you still hear though that, hey, climate change isn't real, isn't happening, or here we've got um, a little elf saying to Santa Claus, notice the North Pole floating away there in the distance. The jury's still out on climate change. The poor old reindeer stuck on that. And there's still politicians that say, you know, climate change isn't real, isn't happening. People like John Howard, who was a prime minister in Australia, was really the, a key person that delayed ac Australia taking action probably when we had a chance to save the reef back around 2000. So Howard, yeah, basically says, yeah, I've always been something of an agnostic on global warming. I've never rejected totally the multiple expressions of concern from many eminent scientists, but the history of mankind, still living in the 60s with his sexist language, the history of mankind has told me of his infinite capacity to adapt in, to changing circumstances of the environment in which he lives. So that's the techno-optical optimism stuff that I talked about before. So he says we don't really need to take action because we'll be able to fix it. Someone's going to invent, you know, some big <coughs> vacuum cleaner and 10 years time, we'll suck it all out and you know, we'll be able to adapt. So that's techno optimism. So don't do anything now because we'll be able to fix it in the future. So, I mean, my view is don't fix it unless, until you know how to break it. Sorry, wrong way around. <laughs> don't break it until you know how to fix it. So if you haven't got a solution to fix it, you shouldn't break it. Um, there's another great quote from a fellow called Ian Lowe, this amazing environmental scientist. He's quite elderly now, but he, I loved his quote. Uh, I heard him say once, he said, the first rule of intelligent tinkering is save all the pieces. Uh, anyway, the, um, people like Howard talk about intellectual bullying. You know, there's all these scientists, you're just rabid greenies. We're not going to accept you because... The reason why they say that is because they can't, you know, they can't respond in terms of facts. So it has to be an attack the person or say, we've got a right to believe what we want or choose to accept the facts we want. Um, you guys are zealots. Or as our um, former uh, Attorney General said, there's true believers on climate change. Uh, and he called the debate ignorant, you know, medieval, and, tr and they were trying to shut down the debate. And I love this response. It was a letter to the editor. Senator Brandis has deplored the sidelining of climate change skeptics in the climate change debate. I echo his concerns with regard to the round versus flat earth debate. While 97% of geographers may claim that the science is already settled and we should reject the views of those skeptics who have, we should reject, we should re respect, sorry, the views of those skeptics who, ha who have a different view. The models of the earth that one sees everywhere known as maps are flat. 
Round Earth sceptics must be given equal space in the press to have their fair say in this debate. I urge Senator De Brandis to extend his support to those who are sick of having their flat Earth views delegitimized. I love the, the models of the Earth that one sees everywhere, known as maps, are flat, terrible maps. And yeah, this is a great quote. If um, guys, at folk who are doing the postgraduate program, uh, I when I was the program director for the environmental management program uh, a few years ago, uh, I was so impressed with Peter Ellington. He's a fellow that teaches critical thinking, and I included one of Peter Ellington's courses on critical thinking in your program. I really recommend it. I just think he's a wonderful lecturer, and he wrote this article on the conversation in response to Brandis and it had this great, the conversation website did this great UFO uh, accompanying his picture and he says, uh, his title was Brandis confuses the right to be heard with the right to be taken seriously. Uh, and he said, the fact that deniers of climate science, the fact is that deniers of climate science are as free as anyone else to make their case. That the case is not being made is not a function of suppression, it's a result of lack of evidence. And yeah, this guy um, back in the Senate now, uh, he's the senator from, for One Nation. He calls climate change a scam. It's, it is basic. The sun warms the Earth's surface. The surface, by contact, warms the moving, circulating atmosphere. That means the atmosphere cools the surface. How then can the atmosphere warm it? It cannot. This is why their computer models are wrong. So there's a lot of responses to this, but I go back to that example I used before of you lying in bed at night with a sheet over you, okay? The blanket, and you pull the blanket over, does the blanket warm you? Where is the warmth coming from? It's actually coming from your body. It's not coming from the blanket. The fact that you feel warmer when you pull a blanket over isn't because the blanket is actually generating any heat. It's that it's slowing down the heat being lost from your body. And the same thing with the greenhouse effect, it slows down the loss of heat. So if you increase the greenhouse effect, you slow down the loss of heat and you then feel warmer on the surface. That's the basic physics or you know, an analogy for the basic physics. So this guy saying, well, the atmosphere is colder, how can it warm the earth? Just you know, obviously he doesn't use blanket's at night. So what's his science background? He's an engineer. <laughs> I think he might be a UQ graduate actually. <laughs> One of our, <laughs> anyway, not going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame of Science here at UQ. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, this was Stefan Ramstorff, a great climate scientist who responded to that and used the blanket analogy. So according to him, it's simple. The body warms the blanket. This means that the blanket cools the body. So how can the blanket warm it? It cannot. <laughs> okay, so yeah, and you can feel it. So look, I really like this quote and I think it's really important to you know, to keep an open mind. So if you haven't looked at climate science before, go and have a look at it and read it and understand it. And if you can come up with a reason why it's wrong, I am going to shake your hand. You're going to win a Nobel Prize. It will be fantastic. I would love it all to be wrong because then we could all go back to, you know, solving other problems and dealing with other things that, you know, this big big, big problem, if it was shown to be wrong, it would be fantastic. Um, we'd love it to be wrong, we'd love the science to be wrong, but just like, yeah, you, you can't just keep an open mind about it, but yeah, not so open that your brains fall out. So there's, there's, many, uh, there's many great um, information sources, skeptical science is great, um, but yeah, these people that want to delay action, um, like our current Prime Minister and Energy Minister, you know, they basically say, oh, well, we don't deny the science, you just don't think there's any need to take any urgent action and we've got to keep jobs and industry going. And, yeah, just calm down, everyone, as the Prime Minister would say, calm down, calm down. The Great Barrier Reef might, you know, there might be bushfires, but we've always had bushfires and, you know, the fact that there's bushfires now, no one can prove it's climate change. So calm down. <coughs> yeah, what motivates these people is not science, it's political ideology. Merchants of Doubt is a really good book on that. Um, yeah, they can't stand the solution. The fact that actually we need to, A, that the market has failed, that you know, we need to have different you know, regulation to, um, re to address these issues, that's the opposition. They don't like the outcome that you get to, so they deny the problem. 
uh, skip through those guys, enough of that. Important to keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. And yeah, I just want to then um, dwell on a couple of strands of evidence. So I love this quote from Naomi Oreskes. There is a scientific consensus over the reality of anthropogenic global warming, and it's based on multiple independent lines of evidence converging on a single coherent account. I think that that's the best summary of why the science is so strong and why there's a scientific con consensus multiple independent lines of evidence converging on a single coherent account. So the three major lines of evidence we've got is climate science and our understanding of how the atmosphere works and the factors that affect it, like the greenhouse effect. We've also got the um, <coughs> Earth's record of the paleoclimate record, evidence of past climate changes from things like ice cores. And we've also got observations of changes in the real world, such as increasing global temperatures. So observations of changes in the physical world includes things include the rise in mean global temperatures, dramatic loss of Arctic sea ice, retreat of glaciers, increase in storm intensity, sea level rise, heat waves, impacts on ecosystems such as coral reefs. All of those things are occurring. They're all strands of evidence that something is happening and the only coherent explanation for that is climate change and driven by humans. So we can see temperature rise. The first 10 months of 2019, the second warmest January to October on record. So, you know, that's um, things that we can observe. We can see that it's happening. Um, just, yeah, been really hot this year. Second warmest, um, likely to be the second warmest year on record. And we're not in an El Nino um, cycle. So, uh, and we know that we can see temperatures are increasing um, but they're not uniform across the planet. So the Arctic particularly is uh, got, you know, a lot of um, warming, the polar amplification. So this is a report from September, the great visual from the Washington Post, basically showing the areas where, um, yeah, we've got two degrees warming already or more, up to six degrees warming in parts of the Arctic to, compared to the mean. So, and coming down through Europe and the Middle East as well, you know, they're already at two years, sorry, two degrees warming. And um, yeah, so about 20% of the planet has warmed by 1.5 degrees. So this is the, the areas that have warmed by two degrees already. And this, these are the areas that have warmed by, well, obviously the red is two degrees, the 1.5 is the orange. So there are already areas that are at those levels and yeah, the fastest warming zones include the Arctic, much of the Middle East, Europe and North, Northern Asia, and the key expanses of ocean. So the rise in average global temperatures is past one degree above pre-industrial levels. We're already at one degree, and our plan is to go on to two degrees. So that's going to have big impacts on places like the Arctic. So yeah, the Arctic is a huge hotspot. Um, and that is consistent then we see, you know, we can see that there's really hot temperatures up there and then it's not surprising that there's also been a collapse in ice. So the Arctic sea ice collapse. So this is a graph uh, including this year's data going, you can see the um, northern hemisphere extent of sea ice. Uh, so since 1980 there's been yeah, basically this huge reduction in sea ice. So the trend is really clear. The average there shown in orange and then the extent in 2012. Um, so, uh, and this is a really good one for not only the extent, but the volume of sea ice is, sorry, the volume has collapsed. So back in 1979, the volume of sea ice was about 16,000 cubic kilometers. And in 2019, it was 4,000 cubic kilometers. So it's really clear that we are not gonna have an Arctic sea ice caps very soon like even this is at one degree warming it's collapsed like the thought of going on at two degrees and we'll still have something now you might think well arctic sea ice we don't live in the arctic um can i just give you an analogy so no one else here is bald so um i'm the only bald person so and hopefully none of you guys will uh, guys or girls will go bald um so uh, it's can tell a joke about bald people because it's one of those things you know you can only tell a Jewish joke if you're Jewish or you can only tell a, a joke if you're um, so but not quite a, a joke but um, you know when you go out you know the, the amount of hair on your head isn't very much compared to your body right but if you were bald 
um, it just makes such a difference. <laughs> like you're on a cold night, I always have a beanie on because it's freezing. And then if you go outside in the sun and you're like baking there in the sun, it is just really uncomfortable. So it's only a little part of your body, but it makes a big difference to your body temperature and you know your feelings of general. So you can think of the Arctic sea ice a bit like the hair on the top of your head. And you know, just as you wouldn't just shave your head and think, oh, well, that's okay. It's not gonna make a big difference to me. It's only a little bit of appearance, you know. Don't want to be too hung up on my appearance, but it actually makes a big difference to you know your temperature and how the you know how you interact with the surrounding world. So the Arctic sea ice you can think of like the planet's going to be bald. It's terrible. Where will we get a wig? So the collapse of the Arctic sea ice, often now called the Arctic death spiral, is a glaring example of down through dangerous anthropogenic climate change under current atmospheric conditions. So this is current levels. We're at one degree, we're planning, you know, the plan is to go on to 1.5 or two degrees. That's the plan, you know, it could be worse than that, we could be a lot more, but you know, even on the best case scenario, there won't be an Arctic. There won't, well, there won't, there will be an Arctic, but there won't be any um, sea ice. So yeah, uh, the loss of the Arctic sea ice uh, is significant because that reflects a lot of sunlight into um, space, like, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere summer, all that wide expanse reflects a lot of sunlight back out. If that's lost, it's absorbed by the ocean, so you have a lot more energy that's now basically got to get out of the Earth system in a different way. So clearly it will change, you know, global weather patterns, Northern Hemisphere patterns, but, you know, globally. Um, the other big effect with Arctic, um, the Arctic sea ice isn't as significant for sea level rise because it's floating, but glaciers, um, there's a huge amount of um, frozen water that essentially can move into the oceans as they melt, so glaciers melting, uh, yeah, the, the melt rate is accelerating, yeah, it's this huge, um, yeah, we're basically seeing uh, in, in an incredible amount of runoff from Greenland and glaciers. So um, that has big impact implications for sea level rise. So yeah, the Antarctic ice shelf collapse and unstoppable sea level rise is very likely without tough climate action, say scientists back in 2015. So the rate of Antarctic melting, so going down to the Antarctic now, uh, has nearly tripled in the, in the past five years and you know, that's, that's happening now. It's like at one degree. So the fifth assessment report um, f concluded that the world had warmed by 0.85 degrees um, to 2012, and that's on, on top of an average of around 14 or 15 degrees. And you know, how can we tell that this isn't just natural variation? Well, I m mentioned paleoclimate records. So scientists, uh, a lot of our understanding of past climates comes from drilling into ice cores. So here's scientists taking an ice core. You can pull it out and you can see the little um, uh, striations in it. Ice on glaciers is laid down as snowfalls each year. If the snow doesn't melt away, so in you know, cold areas, mountainous areas, if the snow doesn't melt away, new snow comes next year and falls on top of it. And then the year after that, more snow comes and falls on top of it and it gets compacted. So you get layers of snow that don't melt away. So in areas where they you know, haven't melted for thousands of years, like Antarctica, when you drill down through that ice, you can look at chemical signatures in the ice and reconstruct what the atmosphere was at those times. So they're able to use proxies um, in the ice core. So here you can see the striations in the ice cap quite clearly. So you've got a historic record of what the temperature or what the atmosphere was composition um, uh, up to hundreds of thousands of years ago, going back to about 800,000 years ago. So uh, the chemical signatures in the ice allow us to work out what carbon dioxide was like, going back uh, now up to about 800,000 years. In this graph, just 600, 700,000 years. So that's carbon dioxide concentration. Temperature uh, is correlated with, you can see temperature there, um, is correlated with carbon dioxide changes, um, but doesn't drive it. So the explanation for this, carbon, carbon dioxide um, uh, lags temperature changes 
by a few hundred years. And, it's, and the big thing that's pushing, so each of these uh, ups and downs, the downs represent glacial periods when basically most of the world is covered in um, glacial ice. And then the up bits in terms of temperature are the interglacial periods when glaciers have retreated. So it's only a change of about four or five degrees makes the difference between an ice age and an interglacial period. So we're in an interglacial period now. So um, what's thought to drive those glacial and interglacial periods is broad changes in the Earth's um, movement around the sun called the Milenkovic cycles. And there's three, there's three cycles that overlap and interact. And they are thought to drive those small changes in the Earth's um, uh, orbit around the sun are thought to basically drive the Earth into and out of um, ice ages. But uh, carbon dioxide acts to amplify the effect, so it's thought to the Milenkovic cycle started, and but carbon dioxide um, uh, amplifies the effect of the Milenkovic cycles. So. Just for scale, human beings came around about 160,000 years ago. So, you know, this record is going back a lot, lot longer than we've been on the planet. And this is where we're at now, or actually a little bit higher, or above 400. And this is where we plan to go in about 45 years, so about 600 on current energy use patterns. So, you know, really different to anything resembling what we've actually had you know, while human beings have been around. The last time carbon dioxide was this high was about three million years ago. So about three times or longer, about more than three times the length of this graph going back. So huge time scales. So um, yeah, that's just a, from a report showing going back 800,000 years where um, carbon dioxide concentrations are at and yeah, we've may well go to something like 900 parts per million. So I'm just going to focus on this, la this little section since the last 12,000 years because it's really interesting. So um, since about uh, 9,000 years ago, the Earth's average temperature has basically been stable. So you see here zero. And then about 6,000 years ago, it was only about half a degree warmer. And then it was dropping back down. And then there's been this spike up at the end. So in terms of human history, so before this there was a glacial period when the, basically the world was covered in snow and ice. In terms of human history, the significance of this period is what? Human civilization. Human civilization. Yeah, so when are the earliest, you know, like, so Aboriginal people have been in Australia for say 65,000 years, but at a, um, you know, at they weren't building mega cities or the like. The Great Wall of Pyra sorry, the pyramids of Egypt were built what, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. The uh, Great Wall of China was built. I know in different stages, but when is the earliest, you know, sort of stages of the Great Wall of China? 3,000. I'm, I'm 2,000 years ago. You know, basically the last. 10,000 years, the period of stable climate has been when the civilization has flourished. So that period when effectively we've been able to, um, you know, move to farming, stable communities, this is when hum human society has flourished. There's virtually been no change or half a degree change in the mean temperature of the planet during that time. And now we've already kicked it out of that and we're looking to go you know, two, three, four, or beyond degrees higher. So completely a fundamental change to um, anything that human, where human society has flourished in. Yes, yeah, so rising sea temperatures cause sea level rise through thermal expansion of oceans and melting glaciers. Uh, you know, so impacts from sea level rise, we can observe that. Those are another line of evidence. Um, floodwaters from Hurricane Sandy, uh, sorry, Hurricane Harvey in 2017. You know, the impacts on our communities are immense. Yeah, so climate change presents an immense challenge to society. Every sane person hopes that the science is wrong. 
And the solutions are not simple, but like a person diagnosed with cancer, I think that that's the analogy to use. You know, we have no choice but to confront the challenge. You know, if you're diagnosed with cancer tomorrow, your first re response would be, I want to get a second opinion. You go on, you know, to another doctor and they say, yep, you've got cancer. You think, I'm going to get a third opinion. Go to the best, science, you know, the best medical specialist you know, in the country or the world, and they say, yep, you've got cancer and you now have to undergo chemotherapy, you're going to lose all your hair and a lot of weight, you're going to be really sick for, you're going to be really sick for the next 12 months, uh, and we give you a 30% chance of survival. Um, the alternative is you don't have treatment and we give you no chance of survival, and you'll be dead within six months. So they're your two prognoses, and most people are going to choose the chemotherapy, because the alternative is worse. So yeah, the time to act was long ago, but now is much better than later, and infinitely better than too damn late. So let's look at the um, responses to it. Um, do we want to do we want to take a break before we jump into looking at dangerous climate change and the definition? Five minutes, ten minutes. What do you think? So of all of that we've just covered. The key thing that I want you to remember is carbon dioxide equivalents because they're a really practical unit to be aware of. Um, beyond that, you know, there's not going to be any questions anywhere in the course or on the exam about understanding climate science or the like. So um, we'll move on to you know, the Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement after the break. So how about we hop up, take a break, let's take 10 minutes, have some grain waves, have some popcorn. Uh, and yeah, come back in 10 minutes. Oh. Is it just me or is it really hot in here? Yeah, it's is it cold? Okay, I feel really hot. <laughs> um, okay. Lights, cameras. So let's move on to look at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Kyoto Protocol will look at it in the next lecture, and then the Paris Agreement will look at the lecture after that. But they're subsidiary agreements to the UNFCCC. Okay, so the UNFCCC got a great website. Uh, you can just search for UNFCCC, it'll pop up for you. Um, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, there's 196 parties. Uh, 195 states plus the EU, and there's an also most of them are parties to the Kyoto Protocol, um, but that doesn't include the US or um, Canada, which ratified but withdrew in 2012. So the Executive Secretary from 20 2000 to 20 was it from 2000? Was it 16 years? I'm not sure if I put got that wrong. It might be 2010 to 2016. Anyway, this wonderful woman from Costa Rica, Cristina Fergules, she is very dynamic. Uh, again, wonderful to see a really uh, powerful, um, articulate uh, woman in a, you know, such an important leadership role. She did a great job. Uh, and we currently have Patricia Espinosa of Mexico, uh, who was appointed in 2016. So. These are the parties to the UNFCCC. Um, I'm going to explain what Annex 1 and Annex 2 means uh, because Annex 1 are the developed countries but in 1992 and Annex 2 countries are the parties um, that provide parties to provide financial and technical assistance to others um, but aren't um, yeah, often Annex 1 countries, and then non-Annex 1 countries that were basically the developing countries as at 1992, but they're not actually included in an annex to the UNFCCC. So you're an annex, you're a non-Annex 1 country by default. If you're not in Annex 1, you're an annex, non-Annex 1 country. So, sorry, and then I should just go back. So the non-Annex 1 countries are all of the 
countries in yellow there. So China, India, Middle East, Africa, obviously Southeast Asia other than uh, Australia and New Zealand, and then S Central and South America are all non-Annex 1 countries. And then the um, Russian Federation were the economies in transition. So remember this is 1992. This is uh, the USSR just broke apart. Um, they didn't want to, you know, a, you know, say that they were a developing country, but they also didn't want to make any financial commitments because they didn't have much money. So they were sort of given a special status and called the economies in transi transition. And yeah, the developed countries, the Annex One countries, are the U.S., Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. So yeah, those groups have different. Uh, obligations under the UNFCCC and Kyoto Protocol, largely now redundant under the Paris Agreement, but still in terms of understanding our historic context and how we got to the point we are now, they're still worth understanding. So Annex 1 countries, there were 43 countries uh, listed in Annex 1, including the EU, and they were the industrialised or developed countries. And the economies in transition uh, in 1992, so there were 14 uh, economies in transition that under the former centrally planned USSR. So Annex 2 countries were the ones, that basically the rich countries. So Australia was an Annex 1 and Annex 2 country and they were provided to provide financial and technical support to the economies in transition and developing countries. So then non-Annex 1 countries was everyone else. So if you weren't listed you're a non-Annex 1 country which included China and um, India and the like. Now, obviously China was in a very different financial position in 1992. It was only then just beginning its rise as a global superpower. So now it's, you know, still, it's sort of straddling the fact that it's a very rich country in many ways, well obviously with a huge population, but very rich, very um, industrialised, technologically advanced, uh, and yet uh, also straddling saying, well, wanting to maintain the developing country status in many ways, so maintaining the, the lack of obligations for that. So there's a difficult um, issue around that because China has changed fundamentally, obviously, and now is a massive emitter and a very uh, important uh, industrial powerhouse and financial powerhouse. Then um, other groups to be aware of are Annex B, so this is under the Kyoto Protocol, and I'll open up those and just show you what they mean, but effectively um, they were, there's a cross-reference back from the protocol to the UNFCCC to basically countries that were Annex 1 countries that accepted binding commitments under the Kyoto Protocol. So. Um, they were included in Annex B to the Kyoto Protocol. So they included uh, countries like Australia and Canada at the time, although Canada then withdrew. So, and then least developed countries were 49 um, LDCs. They were given special status. So I'll unpack that a bit um, as we go. So the parties um, to the UNFCCC meet annually, and so we've got the next COP coming up very soon, and it's moved from Chile where it was to be held. Was it Chile or Peru that was in? Chile. Chile. It was supposed to be in and then because of the current uh, unrest in Chile, it's moved to where? Madrid. To Madrid. Yep. Yeah, so it's moved just, uh, and they announced it like six weeks ago, so you know, instead of 10,000 people or however many people were going to Chile, then they all had to basically change and go um, to the other side of the planet really. So that's coming up. So it's an annual event at the end of the year. I say event, that's the wrong word, an annual meeting. Uh, thousands of people attend it, uh, attend it and um, at it, there's the com conference of the parties to the UNFCCC, that's the COP. There's also um, a meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol, that's called the CMP. And there's now the meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement, which is called the CMA for, in terms of acronyms. So we've got COP, CMP and CMA. And so like looking at, say, COP15 was CMP5, which was held in Copenhagen in 2009. So they are occurring in, uh, at the same time. There can be meetings of the different parties to the, 
the different um, conventions protocol. So here's just a list uh, up to 2019. Um, so meeting in different places around the world and you can see it's all COPs up until 2004. Then there's the first uh, CMP, that's the CURDA protocol coming in, in uh, at COP um, 11 in 2005. And then you see the um, yeah, the CMPs coming in since 2015 as well. So those meetings happening at the same time. Anyway, just some of the acronyms around them. A couple of um, uh, little asides. So this was a lovely student uh, in this course um, uh, a few years ago, and this was a, a. So she, her background was she worked. She was from Malaysia. She worked for the Department of Agriculture in Malaysia, and she went as one of the. Um, members of the Asian delegation to the Conference of the Party in Poland in 2008. So Beatty um, was her name, lovely uh, lady, and she was over in Australia, sponsored by her government, doing a Master's in Environmental Management, and then planning to go back. Uh, and so the thing that I'll emphasize is even though you, know, you might be doing a degree, your background might not be in climate change. You know, if you have a background in farming or something else and say you're working for the government you can still end up involved in these international meetings and you're representing you know your department or that aspect of your country that is of concern to the government and is affected by climate change so that's the malaysian delegation uh, in 2008 and Beatty is uh, you can see her there with a the long coat on and then other members and then that's a picture she took um, sitting in one of the plenary sessions. And you can see Ban Ki-moon there. I can't tell, uh, identify any of the others. And then this is a picture taken at one of their breakfast meetings where they you know, meet and discuss what was going on during the, during the day. Um, and there's Beatty. So why do you think they go with like 15 members? Why, do, why would you send that along? Why can't you just send along one or two? You know, they're just gonna sit down in the plenary sessions and, you know, listen and vote. And you know, they've all got different backgrounds, yep. So you might want to have like a critical mass to contribute different ideas. Yep, you've got to... Along the same lines, yeah. You just need so many different specialties to... Different specialties? Uh, yes, is, a, is part of the answer. But uh, it, these big... Um, meetings. There's not just plenary sessions where everyone's sitting in. There'll be a lot of side meetings happening at the same time. So if there's five meetings going on at the same time, obviously one person can't attend all of those meetings. So by having like a team or a delegation of say 15, you might send along two people to each of those side meetings that's going on. So negotiations are happening in parallel. So that's a reason for having a number. So what happens for countries that simply can't afford, say, to send along a team of, say, 15? So some countries like Australia might, delegations from Australia have been known to get up around about 100. Like, um, but a country, let's just say, um, we'll pick any, let's just say Zimbabwe or, or um, Kiribati or, um, say, Palau. Let's just say Palau. So small island country, uh, developing country, climate change is very important to it, but it simply can't afford to send along 15 people to this conference to be involved. So how do they get by? If, let, if they send along one person, how does, how does a country with only one delegate, how do they survive if there's meetings happening in parallels? They team up. Yep. So they typically team up around the voting blocks. So we mentioned the G77, which is the essentially the developing country block. So one of the advantages of being on a voting block like that is you can discuss what your position is and someone else might, you know, you essentially can share resources and you can have, so someone else can go along, there can be representatives of the G77 or many at these various meetings that are going on representing that block and then they can report back and you know you can have meetings where you agree on what's going to be decided or you know what your limits are and 
the voting blocks are how you survive if you're a small country that can't have a large delegation. So Malaysia is somewhere in the middle. It's, you know, it's part of the G77, but they've also got a significant number of representatives there too. Okay, so I wanted you to take away from that little aside about Beatty that ordinary people like you and me do a lot of work at these international meetings and you could be, you know, it could be part of your future. Even if you know you don't spe you haven't specialised in climate change science in the past, whatever background you have, uh, it's you know relevant to climate change, and so you could be working for your government in the future, and part of these international meetings. And if not at the UNFCCC, then other uh, related you know other international meetings for different um, conventions. So. Uh, we'll look at the current and later negotiations, ongoing negotiations later. Um, I want to just focus more on the text of the UNFCCC briefly. And I really just want to focus on dangerous climate change and what it means. So uh, the Article 2 of, so, you know, this convention, same as the ones we've looked at before, starts with the preamble. We're really concerned about anthropogenic climate change. It's a threat to the world community. Then we go into some definitions. Then Article 2, objective. The ultimate objective of this convention and any related legal instruments that the conference of the parties may adopt is to achieve, in accordance with the relevant provisions of the convention, stabilisation of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. That's commonly known as avoiding dangerous climate change. So that's the objective of the convention. And then it doesn't say a number, so it's qualitative only, not quantitative. It gives three qualitative measures. The first is that such a level should be achieved within a time frame sufficient to, one, allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to climate change. So that's the first qualitative criteria. The second is that it will ensure food production is not threatened. And third is to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. So those are three qualitative criteria for what they meant by avoiding dangerous climate change. There's no number in that, and we'll see when we get to the Paris Agreement. Okay, so the target now is um, the global community has defined dangerous climate change as avoiding a mean global temperature rise of two degrees, or if possible, less than 1.5 degrees. But two degrees is widely seen as the measure of dangerous climate change. And that's quantitative, so there's a number attached to it. So. Article 2, there was historic origins to that, and it's a great article by Michael Oppenheimer and Annie uh, Pethsonks um, from a decade ago, but they looked at, you know, where did that come from and what were the numbers that were associated with it, and there was a whole heap of literature on that. And it wasn't two degrees, there wasn't any consensus on what the number was, and basically the EU pushed for two degrees to be the number that... So really for, um, for basically a decade, the EU policy on d climate change has been set around two degrees and avoiding, avoiding rises in mean global temperatures around that. And really we've ended up at that because of that sort of history and the push particularly from the EU. Um, but it didn't, you know, it wasn't part of the original convention back in 1992. Then Fast forward in 2009 in Copenhagen, there was this disaster where essentially the globe couldn't agree on what we do after the, because the, the Kyoto Protocol that had been agreed in 1997 had a commitment period, first commitment period was from 2008 to 2012 when there were binding targets. And so they needed to agree on what came after that. And in 2009, they couldn't agree on that. And there was this just disaster and it ended in acrimony and, yeah, it was just this mess. Um, Barack Obama, who'd just been elected as the president at that time, flew in and plucked out of the ashes of the Copenhagen disaster, the Copenhagen Accord, where the two degree target sort of rose up. And you see there in the middle that they talk about the scientific view that the increase in global temperature should be below two degrees Celsius on the basis of equity in the context of sustainable development. There wasn't any mention there of 1.5 degrees. It was two degrees really for a long time, really right up until the Paris Agreement in 2015. It was all about two degrees. 
or you know that was the main number um, that was talked about. So um, yeah, the Conference of Parties COP15 in 2009 called for an assessment and there was a reference to 1.5 degrees there because particularly the small island states, so the alliance of small island states, AOSIS, so Kiribati, the Maldives, um, all of the small low-lying states that will be wiped out at two degrees, they're saying, well, two degrees is not acceptable to us because we will no longer exist as a nation, so you have to go lower. So AOSIS has been pushing for lower targets and in the Copenhagen 2009, there's, okay, st let's study it. Then the Paris Agreement, as I've said, has set this target. So this is 2015. And you can really think of it as a hard target as two degrees or aspirational 1.5 degree. So this agreement enhancing the implementation of the convention, including its objectives. So it's a reference back to Article 2. Um, the target is holding the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature to increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, recognising this would significantly reduce the impacts of climate change. So they're the targets that have now been set and that's the big you know, policy drivers for globally. But those numbers weren't in the original UNFCCC. They've come much more, re much more recently. Okay, Article 4 talks about providing um, essentially contributions and, and that's in the Paris Agreement. Again, I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, I just wanted to flag with you, I'm really interested in or really want you to be conscious about uh, interpreting treaties because I think that that's a really useful skill for you and builds your confidence in reading them and understanding them. So how does the Copenhagen Accord and the Paris Agreement in 2015 affect Article 2 of the UNFCCC? Because there was no reference to two degrees originally. What's the impact now? And I've mentioned this provision before, but in the Vienna Convention on Law of the Treaties, you can take into account any subsequent agreement. So in interpreting now the UNFCCC, the Copenhagen Accord 2009 was pretty airy and it wasn't agreed by everyone. So it was a good indicator, but it wasn't hard. Now in the context of the Paris Agreement where everyone's agreed to two degrees as a hard target, it's quite clear that that's, you interpret the original tr treaty objective in light of the subsequent agreement around two degrees. And you can do that within the normal rules for interpreting international treaties. So two degrees is our objective, 1.5 with sort of fingers crossed. So will we leave the GBR for our children? I've said that that's a big driver for, my, for me. And the simple answer is that basically at even current levels, we expect it to be severely damaged and at two degrees, coral reefs will be gone. So coral bleaching is one of the big impacts from extremes of uh, temperature. So coral bleaching, you can see this white coral here. Um, it occurs, corals are a symbiosis, you can roughly call them an animal and a plant. Um, and the plant basically photosynthesizes and produces sugars and the animal basically feeds on surrounding algae coming through the water column and it gets the effectively nitrogen and phosphorus to give to the plant. So it's a symbiosis. And they live in nutrient deserts, so very, very little uh, or very low levels of available nitrogen and phosphorus. So they're, it's essentially an energy expensive life form, but they survive in those and, and have flourished in nutrient deserts through this symbiosis. So what happens in extreme temperatures is the symbiosis breaks down and the algae starts to produce a toxin and the animal kicks out the algae. And when it's expelled, the algae is what's got the pigments in it for the photosynthesis and that's why the coral goes from like a colourful to white because the, the part of it that's got the pigments is, is being expelled. And so here you've got an acropora coral. This one's actually not that colourful, it's more brown. Can you see down here the brown at the bottom? It's not shadow. That would have been its natural colour or like a light brown, an acropora or a branching coral. And 
Uh, so there's high, high water temperatures, but also light. So you can see there the bits that would have been exposed to light are the areas that are bleached, and the bits that would have been in shade are less bleached. So it's a complex, um, yeah, and it, yeah, it basically corals, it, light, high temperature um, leads to coral bleaching, and there have been massive coral bleaching events um, globally, four of them so far, linked um, particularly with um, the background increase in rise in global temperatures and sea surface temperatures, and then in years when there have been El Ninos, um, so that you get essentially hotter temperatures on top of the rise in the background. There have been massive bleaching events. So this is a before and after in American Samoa. The, the one on the left is taken to December 2014, and the second image was taken in February 2015. And you can see what an acropora coral that's been extensively bleached. And they start white and they look pretty, but they don't stay white. They get covered in algae quickly. And so they go from white to brown. So this is the same area of corals on the um, Polaris Island in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef near Hinchinbrook. Uh, bleached in 1998, the first global mass coral bleaching event. White on the left, then um, same patch of reef four years later, covered in algae, brown. Then a couple of years later, 2004, still brown, but it's actually starting to recover. You can see a cropper of corals coming back in there. So if there was only ever one bleaching event, the reef would recover. The problem is that, yeah, we expect repeated bleaching events. This was actually the image that I was, when I was reading my PhD, when I was studying for my PhD, this was the image that completely changed my life. Uh, I was, it was late at night. I'll I tell you the background to reading this. It was about 2004, and until that point, I was, I'd started a PhD because I finished my master's, and re research was so much fun that I just rolled it into a PhD, and I was working as a barrister in the city and sort of fitting in PhD at, you know, between the hours of 2 a.m. and 4, you know, 6 a.m., around work and it was the middle of the night it was dark outside I remember it was just quiet it was I had an office just in the Queen Street up in the Queen Street Mall it was dark outside no noise and I had come across this paper about basically showing mass coral bleaching event on the GBR in 1998 and 2002 and these two maps I remember looking at and I had been thinking until that point that um, pollution and fishing were the big threats to the GBR. I didn't really think that co climate change, yeah, it's going to happen sometime in the future, but it's a long way away and corals are so robust, they must be able to survive this, you know, there's, you know they're a really hardy life form. This completely changed my life because if I focus in, so I'm just going to focus in on this section. So what they're showing is the Queensland coastline in 1998 and, and in 2002 and then if I focus in on the legend and the right-hand side, so this is the 2002 bit around the Whitsundays where I'm from. So Proserpine was where I was born, and the Whitsundays is right beside that. So, and what this, what they're showing here is they went out and actually surveyed bleached um, corals in 2002. So they're the dots, and if there's a red dot, there's over 60% bleaching. If there's a blue dot, there's less than 1%. And then in the background, they've also got satellite records of sea surface temperatures during that same period and they were looking at basically heating periods so um, if it's blue it never got above 28 degrees celsius on the surface for three days or more and then if it's red it got above 33 degrees for three days or more and now you don't need to be an expert in statistics to work out that the red dots basically line up with the blue dot with the red areas and the blue dots basically line up with the blue areas. So um, here around the Whitsundays, the red um, background temperatures, the hot waters, correlate. You know, there is an outlier here, which I think is somewhere around Hamilton Island and the like. That might just be a local anomaly with upwelling or for whatever reason, the currents in that area, who knows? But um, overall, the red hot water temperatures correlate really clearly with the extreme bleached areas. And then out here um, off the coast in the cool, with the cooler waters, very, very little bleaching. Now the scary thing I thought with this was that there was bleaching that was evident from the tip of Cape York all the way down to the south of the Great Barrier Reef 
and from the inner reef, which is the more polluted and affected, to the outer reef. So there's areas like here around the Swain reefs and the outer reef, which are pristine, and they were impacted by. And so I looked at this, and I just remember swearing just repeatedly and going, oh my God. like being shocked that bleaching affected the whole reef from the inner reef to the outer reef. Sure, it's not entirely gone in one year, but it was obvious then that this could wipe out the reef really rapidly and you could lose like the whole reef. Um, so the extent of the bleaching and where it was occurring, it was like really obvious in 2004 that this was a massive threat. And by 2007, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority was acknowledging that and saying this is a you know, big threat, the reef has a poor outlook. So, um, so that was clear by 98, 2002, that coral reefs were extremely threatened. Then we had another bleach, it took a decade or more for another mass bleaching event, but 2016 we had a mass bleaching event. And again, that reflected, so see here in 2016, where the bleaching occurred was north of Cairns, and that was where there was the hot water temperatures. So obvious correlation between the hot water temperatures and mass bleaching. And um, yeah, Terry Hughes, is, uh, one of Australia's leading coral reef scientists said, there's no support for the hypothesis that good water quality confers resistance to bleaching. And that's really significant because our whole strategy in Australia around protecting the Great Barrier Reef is improving water quality and there's no evidence that it actually protects it in, in any way. And I'll give you the analogy like this. I think of it like this. Um, so, okay, you're healthy. Everyone here is healthy. Okay, exercise. And, okay, well, that's all really good. Being healthy is a good thing. But if someone walked through that door now and pointed a shotgun at you and blew a hole in your chest, you would die. Okay, so being healthy doesn't protect you from a shotgun blast to the chest. Same for coral reefs. Um, mass coral bleaching is like a shotgun blast to the chest. The fact that you've increased, you know, improved its resilience through improving water quality, making it healthy, doesn't actually protect it. So um, we've also had a mass coral bleaching event in 2017, and sadly, it looks to be on the cards for early 2019, you know, with these really hot temperatures that we've got. It's not even an El Nino year, but it, you know, unless we get a cyclone, we can expect some you know, significant bleaching next year. It, it varies because cyclones do, you know, if they churn up the water, um, it's not clear that, it, you know, it's not certain that will occur, but it's, it's looking on the cards. Okay, so we've had mass coral bleaching events. Um, that's what we see in Australia is reflected around the world. Coral reefs are being hammered right now, like at one degree mean global warming. Um, the projections yeah, oh yeah, there's all these other sad stories that shocking coral spawning drop raises doubts over GBR's resilience. So yeah, basically the, the wax in 2016 have really knocked the reef's ability to spawn. This was an article from April 2014. And yeah, spawning by dominant um, coral species in the GBR collapsed after back-to-back -back mass bleaching events, stoking fears about the reef's biodiversity and resilience. We were shocked at the extent of the decrease at Terry Hughes, the paper's lead author. Oh, look, let's just move on. I just, it's just such, I just want to emphasize this, talked about the, you know, shift in mean global temperatures and it's the extremes that kill corals. So we know we've shifted the temperature distribution and it's the extremes that are killing them. So. Um, back in 2007, uh, Ophir Goldberg, so a decade ago, Ophir Goldberg, a great scientist here in the Global Change Institute, might only be 100 metres from us now. Well, the Global Change Institute is only about 50 metres from us now, but Ove might literally be there. Great um, scientist. Um, he was the lead author in this paper, um, and they projected, this was the images they used to say what they thought coral reefs would look like. On the left is at current levels in 2007, so about one degree warming, 375 parts per million CO2, so relatively healthy. At two degrees warming, they thought corals would be based at 450 parts per million to 500 corals hammered, and past three degrees, corals completely gone. And yet, yeah, ocean acidification is whacking corals as well. Uh, there's a lot, been a lot of reports for the last decade saying there's high confidence that corals are highly threatened, 
Um, Grumper was saying in 2007 that coral dominated reefs are likely to largely disappear by two degrees. So that's our leading coral reef agency in Australia. Um, and yeah, a lot of science saying at two degrees, it's unlikely to save GB up the, the reef. And then when the Paris Agreement occurred and there was this aspirational target for 1.5 degrees, I thought, holy mackerel, maybe, you know, maybe there's some hope for, for them. Um, and then last year in October, um, the IPC released its special report on 1.5 degrees and there'd been little work on corals, the impacts at 1.5 for corals. And this is what the IPCC concluded. Um, coral reefs are projected to decline by a further 70 to 90 percent at 1.5 degrees, with larger losses over 99 percent at 2 degrees. That's globally. That's gl globally. So this is an ecosystem that millions of people depend on for food. And at 2 degrees, it's all gone. Even, and that's a further 70 to 90 percent. We've already lost 50 percent of corals. So that's a further. It's not just 70 to 90 percent in total. That's 70 to 90% of the remaining 50%. Tropical, tropical coral reliefs will reach a very high risk of impact to two degrees. Um, coral dominated ecosystems will be non-existent at this temperature. And even achieving ambitious reductions goals of 1.5 under the Paris Agreement will result, result in further losses of 90% of reef building corals compared to today with 99% of corals being lost under two degrees. So those are the goals that we've set globally and they're completely inconsistent with coral reefs continuing to exist. And then, yeah, there's a lot of people, us, you know, even achieving two degrees is gonna be hard. So we could be looking at more like four. Corals are long gone by then. I'll come back and talk about those things um, NDCs next year, next in our lectures tomorrow. But basically, this Article Two um, of the Paris Agreement setting goals, where basically we're saying we're not going to have coral reefs because the science is really clear that they're gone at those levels. So Australia has signed up. You know, it's yeah. This I just find it incredible that you know we could agree to something that we know is going to destroy our, you know, most important ecosystem. Yeah, and, you know, I come from that area and, the, you know, the, the impacts on the communities, it's not just the loss of, you know, food from the reef, but, you know, the lifestyle aspects of it, you know, it's going to devastate communities. Some people criticise the two degree warming goal and, yeah, it's got problems, but it's the only thing that's really been widely used and it's still it's explaining some other goal uh, is really hard so and from a communication perspective so these guys criticized the two degree warming goal but they didn't actually suggest a better goal they just kicked it um, so a lot of work around you know what our target should be what our goals should be the two degree goal is really the one that's been internationally set and we've got to work with um, a lot of um, you know, a lot of research saying, you know, if we keep going, burning fossil fuels will basically make the earth practically uninhabitable. Um, and you know, my view is based on the available science, we should be aiming to return to 350 parts per million. So we're at 407 parts per million CO2 now. We should be aiming to stop and go back um, because and limit temperature rises to current levels of one degree. And that constitutes dangerous climate change. Because if you look at the criteria in Article 2, you know, allowing ecosystems to adapt naturally, well, going beyond one, like if you're losing coral reefs, then you're not allowing ecosystems to adapt naturally. You're not protecting food production and you're not allowing economic development to proceed in a sustainable way. So you're not actually meeting the criteria for dangerous climate change. Sure, you're meeting the now quantified target um, under the Paris Agreement, but it doesn't actually reflect the criteria in the original agreement. So um, 350 is reflected in a famous paper from a decade ago um, by James Hansen and his colleagues, target atmospheric CO2, where should humanity aim, saying we should be aiming for 350 parts per million. So less than we're currently at would be an incredible effort to get there. My view is that's the goal we should set but it's not the goal that we do have set. There's a, um, 
a lot of work by Professor Joanne Rockstrom about um, uh, safe operating spaces for humanity. Um, the 350 parts per million target is part of that. Um, they've looked at planetary, the idea of planetary boundaries. I won't go into them, but with climate change, they set 350 parts per million. We're already beyond that. And um, an organisation which, yeah, um, grew out of Hansen's work was 350.org, um, led by Bill McKibben, Kibben, and they were pushing for that. Um, they've got very, you know, there's gotten very little support from governments other than, say, AOSIS for those sorts of targets. So it's simply not the targets that the global community is setting or prepared to set. So will we leave the Great Barrier Reef for our children? Tragically, the clear answer we're giving to that is no. And John Holdren, the scientific advisor for Barack Obama, said we've basically got three cho choices. Mitigation, so reducing emissions. Adaptation, dealing with the changes that we're causing. And suffering. And we're going to do some of each. And the question is, what will the mix be? The more mitigation we do, the less adaptation will be required and the less suffering there will be. Yeah. And I like this quote from Al Gore as well. Uh, so he said, lots of people go from denial to despair about global warming without pausing in between. You know, when you look at the evidence, if you hadn't been aware of it before, I actually don't think most people go from denial. I think most people go from don't know to when you actually look at the evidence and you go, hey, this is incredibly bad and there aren't any obvious solutions and looking at the world now it doesn't look like we're going to get anywhere near to what we need to do to save coral reefs so you go from don't know to despair without pausing in between and what I want to say to you is pause in between and um, tomorrow I want to talk about uh, personal resilience and dealing with loss and dealing with you know maintaining hope um, because the the common, what's the common thing about denial and despair in terms of your actions? If you deny something is a problem, do you have to take any action? Okay, well, if you despair about a problem, is there any point in taking action? Because no, because there's no point. You've despaired about it. So denial that there is a problem and despair about a problem have the common outcome that you don't take any action. And the reality is that we need to work somewhere in between we can't deny that there's this massive problem, but we also can't despair about it because you know there is no other place that we're going to go. There is no other place that our kids are going to live in. So we can't just despair about it and say, oh, it's too bad, change the channel. There's no channel to change this to. You know, If you don't like the movie, change the channel. I don't like this movie at all. I really want to change the channel. <laughs> Can I have something other than global warming, please? Um, but there's no channel to change to. This is the only one we've got to watch. So we've basically got to see it through and do the best with the bad hand we're dealt. So to wrap up, key climate change notion certification science, um, I really just want you to remember carbon dioxide equivalents. It's an important term to be aware of in terms of greenhouse accounting. And then in terms of the UNFCCC, uh, the dangerous climate change was the objective. It's, it set a broad um, framework, um, but left the details to be worked out under later agreements and so we'll go in the next lecture to uh, consider briefly the Paris, sorry, the Kyoto Protocol and then tomorrow we'll talk about the Paris Agreement and, and its structure as well. So summary, there are multiple independent lines of evidence that establish that climate change and ocean acidification pose a great threat to human civilization. The UNFCCC has an objective of avoiding dangerous climate change, which is commonly thought of as avoiding mean global temperature rises of two degrees. And on current policies and practices, the globe is going to warm by way beyond that, leading to catastrophic consequences. And fourthly, ordinary people do a lot of work in international meetings, and you could be one of them in the future. So if you want to read more about this, the UNFCCC website it has got heaps. The IPCC website has also got heaps and heaps of information. Let's wrap up there. Um, it's 10 past four. Um, should we take a five minute break, come back and look at the Kyoto Protocol? And I really just want to run you through uh, the major mechanisms under it. Um, they're 
an important, it's important really to understand what happened with the Kyoto Protocol to then understand how we get to the Paris Agreement and why there isn't anything more concrete in the Paris Agreement. Because what we see is the Kyoto Protocol, they try for some top-down measures and they couldn't basically, they didn't work and also they just wasn't, um, for a range of reasons they couldn't repeat them in the Paris Agreement so they tried for a bottom-up, completely discretionary, you know, each country tell us what you can do and will do and we'll take whatever you can give us uh, rather than a top-down approach. So the nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. So let's take five minutes uh, and come back uh, and we'll talk about the Dakota Protocol.